So I think we're ready to go. Um, so welcome everyone to this latest masterclass from Beal. My name is Daniel King and I've been joined today by Yannick Pelletier. Hello. Hi Danny. Thanks for joining uh, me. And, and we thought that it might be uh, appropriate to talk about Victor Korchner. I think so indeed, yeah. And of course, Yannick, being a Swiss player, <laughs> you have a very special connection with Korchner. And when was the first time you, you met Korchner actually? Well, the first time I saw him in flesh and blood and was, I don't really know, but it was at some, some tournament. I was a, a kid. Um, so it's really hard. I was very, very little. Um, I saw the person, but I first time I heard about him was 83 when he played the candidates against Kasparov at uh, the semi-final. And, and then I probably saw him probably in 85 or 86, something like this. And the first time I met him was in, um, I think in 93, when, uh, when Viktor Korchnoi gave a clock simul against the Swiss youngsters, a team of Swiss youngsters near Zurich. Uh, we were 10 and he, he beat uh, the opposite team, eight and a half, one and a half. But I, I won a, quite an interesting game with Black in the okay. Botvinnik. That was, oh, well done. Um, yeah. The when you say the bot vinic, you mean the, the complicated variation complicated, of the Slav. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And, um, but the first time we met over the board, I mean, on, in a real game was in 96, uh, at the Bern. It was not the Open, it was something special in that year. And, um, yeah, the thing is, we, we played, it might have been in February or March, it was in the winter. And a few weeks before that, he, he was on holiday with his wife, uh, skiing in the Swiss Alps. I think it was cross-country skiing, and he he fell and had a problem with his ankle. I can't remember if he mm. broke it or torn it. Anyway, he was playing. You know, he was going with crutches, and uh, he was playing with a. Um, you know, you could see uh, uh, the leg was up, and uh, <laughs> and so I, well, we started, and of course, he did not get up once during the game because he couldn't, and, okay. and he beat me properly. Mm. And so I thought basically, you know, Viktor Korchnoi um, had to stay over the board. He was focused the whole time. And uh, indeed, that was one of the reasons also why he won, because he was completely focused on the game. And then I noticed that he actually, even when he has his two legs fit, he wouldn't He's get up basically, except for going to the toilet. Always or completely focused. Yeah, totally. And that, that was something which really... Uh, stayed very you know it's impressive very impressive and I noticed he was not the only one but basically the few players who do this stay focused sit the whole game through are just very very strong yeah I should just say for for those tuning into this broadcast that what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about Victor Korchnoi who of course died well uh, not so long ago a few few weeks ago uh, at the age of 85 and of course he after leaving the Soviet Union he became a Swiss citizen and so uh, and that and that was in 19 uh, the late 70s 90, did he? 78 I 78. think that he came to Switzerland yeah before so, that he stayed in the Netherlands for a while in yeah. Germany and he was actually stateless he didn't have a yep. passport yeah. True, yeah. but he, he managed to gain Swiss citizenship and of course so he has, uh, well, a very long-standing connection with Switzerland. He lived here and was very much part of the Swiss scene and, of course, very much connected with this Beal tournament. He played here yeah. several times. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about Korchner. We want to sort of pay tribute to the man um, and also demonstrate some of the games that he, he played in Beale. Mm -hmm. um, so... Starting with this one, and this was the very first time that Korchnoi played in the Beale tournament in 1979. Yeah, and just, just a year after he came to Switzerland. So, uh, Yannick, tell, tell us what happened. Well, that was um, a tournament where, um, you know, Beale started in, in 1968 and every year there was an Open, not especially strong Open, until 76 when FIDE awarded the well, one of the interzonal tournaments to Beale, mm. and that's where Beale became famous on the chess scene. Mm. And after that, 
the organizer, Hans Suri, and his crew, basically his family that were helping him, uh, decided to stage uh, a closed tournament at the start, not especially a strong one. And um, yeah, that's how the tradition actually started of having not only just one open or one event, but just you know, a few tournaments mm. making it actually a festival as it now became. Um, and 71, uh, 79 was definitely one of the first years when a, a close tournament took place and Viktor Korchnoi, as you can see there, he had 26.95. Nowadays you would say this is just about top 50, but yeah. <laughs> back then it was number two in the world just behind uh, just behind uh, Anatoly Karpov, I think Mikhail Tal also had a peak at 2700 by these years. Anyway, this was clearly the... Of, of course, we should say that just the year before, in 1978, Korchnoi, of course, had played this famous World Championship match against Anatoly Karpov in the Philippines in Baguio, where uh, it, the score got to 5 all, mm, yeah. and then uh, Korchnoi lost that, that game, and so Karpov won with 6-5, um, and it, it was an, an extraordinary match, I mean, so hard fought. Yeah. Um, so, I think in, in these years, 78, 79, uh, 80s, I always think of Korchnoi being at his absolute peak. It's true, yeah. And so, his first tournament in Beale in 1979, so Yannick, tell me his results in 1979. Yeah, well, he, he actually smashed uh, the field. He won the tournament with uh, 12 out of 13. Um, can't remember the two draws against whom he made, but actually he, well, he won very convincingly. 12, 12 out of 13. Now, this, we have to say this was not the strongest field. Nevertheless, it was a remarkable performance. And the next player down was Heinz Wittenzoom, Mm -hmm. With seven and a half points. Yeah, that's, now, that's a gap. Yeah. <laughs> this, so and what I find fascinating, and this is so typical, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of Korchnoi, is that, of course, he would have won the tournament with I don't know how many rounds to spare, three mm. or four rounds to spare, probably. Probably. Yeah. And yet, he was just keeping hammering on, trying to trying to beat players. Um, this was so typical of, of his uh, of his attitude mm. generally also. Not just, you know, trying to win games, but just to be maximalist, trying to do always the best. Not only just for the sake of records or something, but just also for the love of the game. His life was completely linked to the game. Mm. He lived chess Breathe, would breathe chess every minute, every moment, uh, during tournaments, at home, anytime. So it was just something very natural for him to give his all whenever he would play chess. Um, I mean, this is against Sahovic, who is a pretty decent... Yeah, he used to be good, yeah. Yugoslav Grandmaster. And also a, a regular in Beale in those years. Okay. Uh, not only just playing one of the... They are the main event, but also sometimes he played in the open, but he was known, well, you don't see it, but up there, over there, there is a gallery, which is very typical for the Beale Congress Hall. And in on this gallery, there used to be blitz games mm. until very deep into the night. In 76, for instance, Mikhail Tal was remembered, he used to play the, the Interzonal tournament. Mm. He was remembered playing blitz, those blitz vodka, until very late. Uh, Blitz and vodka. Yeah, the one who wins the game needs to drink a uh, glass of oh, vodka. Nice. So he would just crash through up and after a bottle or something, he would maybe blunder a few things, then the opponents would have to drink a few glasses of <laughs> vodka and then of course he would, he would crash again and, and so on and so on. That's nice. And Shahovic was one of those Blitzy, Blitzkies. So d Yannick, tell me your experiences of, of playing Victor. Well, I... I I haven't counted the number of times I've played against him, but it's 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 a lot, and I, I think in the end he's still on plus one, <laughs> even though I won the last game uh, in 2012 at the Swiss Championship. He was already in a rolling uh, in a wheelchair, in a wheelchair yeah. sorry, yeah. and um, yeah, he was definitely suffering also physically in that tournament because he had troubles even going to the toilet. So it was really painful. I remember that was the last round in, in the morning and uh, at some point he played a move and 
I knew my answer. I still took a minute to, to, to think. And at this moment, he, he started going away because I understood he was going to the toilet. And okay, I waited a few minutes, but then I thought, okay, I, at some point I have to play the move. My, mm. my, my clock was running down and I knew what I had to do. And he came back like 15 minutes later. And, and it was, you know, you don't, it's very difficult. And, and yeah. the game was tense uh, still. I mean, it's not like I won easily, even though in that tournament he suffered, he finished last. Mm. Uh, but the game was, was tense, very, very much tense mm. until the time trouble. And um, uh, well, so many things. When I played against him, but also when I played alongside him mm. in, in the Swiss team, also in the Zurich team, the Swiss league, uh, the last few years, there are so many stories we could tell. And well, uh, I mean, okay, I want to touch upon his, we've mentioned his absolute passion for chess. Yeah. And sometimes this passion, this love for chess, could sometimes spill over. I mean, passion has a... a, a a very positive side and, and a negative side as well. It can do. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, of course. With Victor, it was uh, his um, undiplomatic way of treating some or most of his opponents mm. after a game, especially when the game didn't go the way he wanted or finish the game the way he wanted. And um, yeah. He, there, well, there tell, were us this, tell, tell us this story. You, t you told me earlier about his encounter with um, Paco Vallejo, the, the, the top yes. Spanish player. True. We, in, we in might the... even see one, one part of that game, maybe or not. Anyway, that was 2002. Mm. Uh, in 2001, Victor won the close tournament in Biel ahead of Gelfand and Svidler, and we are going to see one game here also. And this was a remarkable result. He was 70. He was 70 yeah. and there were like two or three players from the top 10 in the tournament and he won that tournament. So in 2002 he played again. The tournament was maybe slightly less strong that year. Still still strong enough. Yes, I of course, say. but not, not probably as strong as 2001. Yeah. And he, uh, in the first round he, he played against Paco Vallejo from, from mm. Spain. Uh, who was probably something like 20 or at that, that time. But very strong. Very player. strong, over yeah. 2600. And in the first round, Vallejo came late to the game. It's not just a few seconds, maybe five minutes, seven minutes, something like this. So Vallejo came, they shook hands and the game started. And I, I remember to see Victor at the start of the game. Okay, they, they played, they played, and, mm. and Victor won that game after four something hours. And right after the game, which Victor won, Victor shouted at Vallejo and saying something like, <coughs> Well, you have to apologize when you come late to the game. <laughs> Young man, this is not a manner. You should learn new manners. Oh. And, um, and then in the second game, because it was a double round yeah. robin, uh, six players, ten, ten rounds. In the second game, Victor beat, beat Vallejo again, who came right to the he game that time. Sure he was <laughs> yeah. that time. But it didn't help. It was already too late. Damage had been done. And, um, well, you know, he, he had this habit of teaching. Uh, yeah, he liked to teach people a lesson. Especially young players, yeah. younger generations. Not only over the board, apparently, but also you know, their behavior. Well, uh, I mean, I, I've played him, I mean, I know you've played him many, many times, but I played him on four occasions. And there was one game I played, uh, Victor, of course, was legendary for grabbing pawns and mm -hmm. hanging on to it and defending and, and, well, very often getting away with it very well. And he took one of my pawns and he took it with such violence. I couldn't believe it. I mean, basically, if it was sort of, um, I don't know, if it was somebody else, I might have said something. <laughs> but he smashed the pawn off and banged the, the clock, clock yeah. so hard. Oh yeah. And I, yeah, I was kind of, um, I was kind of slightly fearful. Yeah. No, sometimes say. he himself did not behave perfectly Absolutely over the board, not. despite yeah. the lessons he would give. Yeah. I remember also a match we played against Croatia in the European Team Championship, it might have been 97, where he faced, with White, he faced Svitan, the Grandmaster, mm. uh, Onion Svitan. Uh, Svitan used to play at the time, was just playing the Kings Indian, and many, many people, certainly spectators, you know how uh, 
what kind of disdain and hate mm. Kochnoi had for the King's Indian or against the King's Indian. He was completely dismissive of this opening. And in that game, Victor played his, I think he played his line, the Korchnoi variation. You mean with Bishop E3? Yes, main 91 yeah. in the classical. I think he had fantastic results. With and this. he did not even let Sweden push his clock, press his clock in the opening phase. Like he played 18 moves instantly and barely let Sweden press his clock. Okay. And the first time Korchnoi started thinking during that game, it went wrong. And he almost got mated. Uh, in the end, he saved the draw, but he almost got mated. Uh, but yeah, he he was not always, you know. When when the thing is, he he had so many emotions. He needed also emotions mm. to put so many emotions into his games. Be it hatred, be it disdain. Um, he needed that as a motivation, yes. as an engine to, to, to be even stronger, especially at that age. Um, that sometimes he could not control himself. Yeah. And, uh, he would sometimes apologize to, you know, sometimes during the, the, with the Swiss team at the Olympiad, he, he would occasionally mm -hmm. come to us at dinner and say, you know, maybe I did not do the right thing with, with him. But that's with very my interesting. Open. Sometimes so he, he actually this. did have a realization that maybe he wasn't being completely correct. Yeah, yeah. But yes, it seems to me that this is um, this is all part of this passion that he mm. that he had, incredible yeah. passion, and that can spill over into sometimes slightly incorrect um, behavior. I mean, I you know I remember from my own games with him that um, they were always completely memorable. Uh, I had four games with him. I won, I was lucky enough to win twice. I lost twice. When he beat me, we had very friendly mm -hmm. relations afterwards and we had post-mortems and a nice chat. And he was very generous to me. Um, when I beat him, uh, we had no post mortems, and once you know he pushed, typically yeah. <laughs> pushed the chair and knocked his chair over, pieces went flying. Uh, oh my god! Yeah, yeah, no, it's but true. It, but there's somehow, I, in, with all this kind of behaviour, there's something that I really liked the man. I have to say, because yeah, of this course, passion, yeah. I, you know, I like to see this passion that people really love what they're doing, and they put so much. Mm -hmm. energy and emotion into the game and he, he really loved chess true sure. it's part of the of the person yeah, yeah it's, it was part of him and well the people are asking online did Korsnoy maintain his calculating ability into old age well, in a way yes um, yeah. well we we know he suffered uh, two strokes and mm. the first one was already pretty pretty bad pretty serious mm. and after that he's playing strength clearly decreased uh, but yeah but before this he was still very 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 good Le less prob less so of course than at his peak and his yeah. younger years but uh, but th this reminds me of course that uh, he was a guest at the London Chess Classic tournaments mm -hmm. over the past uh, few years well not in the last two, two or three years but um, I mean, till relatively recently, I think 2013, he was still giving a simultaneous display, um, and he stuck at it so mm. doggedly. You know, they took a long time. You know, he was in his he was already over 80 years old, um, and played well over I think over 30 players. Could could even be more than that, but certainly 30 players. Um, and he was clearly you know he'd already had a stroke, and he was not in the best of health. But he still played the symbol. Yeah, Just and he would turn down draw offers yeah. <laughs> by his uh, impudent opponents yeah. who would dare <laughs> offering a draw. And uh, this uh, this was also very typical because in a, in a simo you can either take it easy and mm. you know not especially give your best, make it a show, make it something really. Uh, Enjoyable also for your opponents, or you can just say I'm going to crush them all. Yeah, and uh, that's what that was. That's <laughs> that, that was, was Victor's that was his way. <laughs> <laughs> that was his exactly Victor's attitude in the. So I mean, tell us a bit more about his uh, his involvement with the Swiss team, and what was what was it like playing in in the Swiss team with him? I enjoyed it definitely. I mean, as a, as a you know teammate, he was. Um, 
of course, he would keep his tournament rhythm. He would not change his regime. He, he would get up uh, quite early in the morning, have breakfast, caviar sometimes on breakfast. Uh, Did he, he used would to bring that along? Oh, yes, he would bring them with him. He oh, yes, him. yes, he had Fantastic. his own this is style. Am ammunition. Style. <laughs> and yes, and there are stories also about this. <laughs> and, um, and then he would go back to his room, prepare for the game. Uh, he wouldn't come down for lunch, he would just eat a f very small thing in his room, have a nap, a shower before the game, and off he's to the game. Only in the evening would he be really more, I mean, he was sociable, but really he would be a bit more relaxed and be able to talk with the, with the team until, until he was tired and, and would go to his room. But it was enjoyable, we would talk a bit about chess, about many other things, mm. because he, of course, chess was the center of his life. It was everything to him, but he could, you know, talk about other things too. Uh, he liked languages, he liked um, literature, mm. several things. He has his own ideas about yeah, this. Yeah, and definite. that's why it was also interesting to talk. Of course, someone with strong opinions is... Um, he yeah. would sometimes give us tips, or something I remember once we played against China, probably in 2002. And on that day, we were, you know, China was not as strong as they are now, but they still had like Ye Yangshuan 2650 and a few others of over 2600. And he, he would say, no, today I'm not playing. <sighs> Chinese have a very special way to play chess and I'm not interested. Hmm, okay. So that's what, <laughs> well, that's what. You, and then we, had, I had to face the the good guy on board one with, with the third third black in a row. But never mind. And uh, he 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 had this this you know, especially 2002. There would be 14 14 rounds, so it was a lot. Mm. Victor was a fighter, but he wouldn't play all 14 rounds. He would have a rest here and there. Um, but he would choose, of, obviously, when he yeah. wanted to have a rest. And, and also against the Ukraine, he, he had a bad score against Ivanchuk, so he wouldn't like to play Ivanchuk. He felt Ponomaryov was not interesting, then he wouldn't play Ponomaryov. <laughs> so here off he is, and we, we go against the Ukraine with our victor. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, well, that, but uh, it, was, it was always, always, um, as a teammate, but it was, he was always a good teammate. I th yeah, I would say he was a, a very good teammate, yeah. right? and for us it was a, an honor to, to play with him uh, sure. as our leader. And um, that even must have given you somehow the team such confidence to sit down when you have Victor there on yes. first board. Yeah. Especially he was he was almost always you know uh, I was going to say reliable, but I, I meant it reliable. You know, speaking about the result. Yeah. Um, I remember Bled again, Bled 2002, yeah. the first time FIDE drastically reduced the time control. Mm. Victor, I think this must have been the year before, and in his first tournaments with the new time control, which was shorter than, than what it is now, he would really struggle. The 30 seconds increment he would... He wasn't mm. used to it. He wasn't used to it. He wouldn't know if he had the right moves, not right moves. Yeah. The arbiters would come and disturb him during the game. So he really had a rough time. I think that's, in a, that's an interesting point because this change in the time limit was, you know, for, for older players, this was such a radical change. Well, youngsters, they liked it, most yeah. of them. Uh, and they, whether it would be good for chess, for the quality of the games or not, they would just support it because it would improve their result. Um, that's a short sight, uh, short sighted, let's say, vision of chess. But that's another question. Victor himself had, you know, he was getting older and he had more difficulties to ad adjust mm. to the changes, be it the time control or also the appearance of computers. He would take some time to think about what he needs to do and he would adapt. He so would he, he, he adapt. He, he was a survivor. Adapt. Yeah, that's true. He, it would take him some time, but he would adapt. And he actually involved his wife, Petra, into... And they would go, both of them, to, uh, you know, computer courses oh, really? in order to learn how to use a computer, because for older people it's not mm -hmm. an easy thing. And uh, so they would master chess base, oh, okay. basics of chess base and be able to prepare for an opponent 
you know, not with books and, 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 and uh, magazines, but also with a computer, which was, I mean... I, I find that fascinating. I just have this, this picture in my mind of someone instructing Victor about how to, to use windows or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, must, that must have been extraordinary. Well, actually, he, he knew the basics. He, could, uh, he yeah. could load a game, he could search a position, and, but of course, all, all the chess-based subtleties were and, too uh, difficult. Sorry, and it's coming back to the, to the time yes, score, because that, that was the start of the yeah. story. <laughs> just, just to say that he also managed to adjust to the new time control, and in 2002, he was more or less ready at the Olympiad to, to, to play with that time control. And I remember... Well, it was a 14-round tournament, it was really long, so we had ups and downs, but towards the end we came back from some bad matches and we started winning uh, thanks to Victor. I think he finished, uh, he played all the last games after that match against China, which we lost. He played all the last games and he beat Sasikiran from India, he beat uh, the top guy from Argentina, who was a good grandmaster. And in the last round, we played a strong Cuban. Cuban team with Bruzon on mm. board one, Dominguez board two, and s just four grandmasters, mm. over 2,500. And in that last round, round, it was at the end, you know, this, this et eternal time trouble yeah. with the 30 seconds. At some point, Victor, he had maybe four or five minutes, he banged a few moves in a row so that he get the 30 seconds bonus. Yeah. And he, has, he had a few minutes, he, he just stood up took a flask from his, uh, from his bag, which he ha always had with him at, at the tournament, drank something, just put it back and finished off his opponent. Whoa. And we won the match 3-1. I cool. think he won and Florian Yeni won. And we made two draws. And after the game in the evening, Joe Gallagher, who was also part of mm. our team, asked him, but you, you got up and you, you drank something. And what was that? He said, well, <clears throat> that was some... Cognac. <laughs> so Joe said, well, what? Cognac? You drank cognac? Well, you know, it was so tense. I felt my heart was beating too strong. I needed to cool down. Fantastic. And I drank that and, and then it went better. I think there were no doping control. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that's, that's brilliant. But that remi actually reminds me of another story. Um, this is um, a friend of mine who I should big shout out to uh, Jose. Van der Kerkhofer, who's the president of the Ostend Chess Club, who used to uh, organize an annual simultaneous display, and uh, he invited Victor to give this simultaneous, which, which was an outdoor uh, simultaneous mm -hmm. in, in one of the squares in Ostend. And Victor did 40, 40 opponents, not bad. Yeah. Um, and afterwards, you know, they went out for dinner and um, you know, said, Would you like an aperitif? I said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Jose got him a Campari with orange. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Victor went dong. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, give me another of these, but this time without the nonsense. <laughs> In other words, he just wanted straight alcohol. So <laughs> but that's brilliant. Yes, yeah. Cognac during the game, yeah. that's class. Yeah. There we go, that's real class. And actually we could count on him, yeah every time in the, in, with a Swiss team. Sometimes he wouldn't play. Uh, he didn't go to 96 Olympiad because he didn't like Yervan. Probably linked to Petrosian, who was uh, yeah, not a nice opponent for him. Yeah. And uh, he didn't go to Elista, he didn't go to a few places, but generally we could yeah, count I on mean him. He, and he was a very regular member of the Swiss team. Of course, team. yeah. And I, I, I'm a bit... Well, how to say? I, I'm, I think that Swiss chess did not benefit as much as chess players, I mean, did not benefit as much as we could have. Because, um, of course, Victor at the start was top player in the world, so he would sometimes do something for Swiss chess, but not too much. That's normal. And later he would be a bit more involved, even play the Swiss mm -hmm. championship, individual championship. So he would be there. He would also have uh, regular trainings with the uh, best Swiss players, like like six, eight times per year okay, in but Zurich that and Bern. Good. And it was good. And I, what have we become? Just a few grandmasters here, there, occasionally, by chance, maybe. An older generation, the older generation, mm -hmm. older than me, did not become. They did not become grandmasters. Just Lucas Brunner, okay. 
and and that's a little bit sad. It's a bit. Of, I find it a pity that uh, we did not manage to produce but, more grandmasters. But do you think you benefited directly from Victor's involvement? Yeah. Well, actually, I, I, I as a chess player. I, in his attitude, trying not to insult my opponents, though, but <laughs> I was definitely, uh, definitely impressed by all by his energy, by his commitment, mm. and this certainly helped and pushed me, motivated me. Uh, it also motivated me because when I started be to become strong, when I became a grandmaster, Victor was not at his peak anymore. So it was actually, you know, a fight maybe mm. for first place. I'm not talking about fame or anything, but just you know, rankings and. And so it was also an incentive to work more on my chest and try to yeah. be, become stronger than him, knowing fully that he was, he was getting older while I was climbing. So, of course, it was not such a fair, let's say, because, you know, age and time was running yeah. in my favor in yeah. a way. But OK, I became a grandmaster. Florian Yeni became a grandmaster now. He stopped playing chess. And we have a few youngsters, but they barely knew Victor. So mm -hmm. generally, in the 30, let's say 30 years, uh, 35 years, maybe Victor mm -hmm. played actively in and for Switzerland. Yeah. We, 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 you know. It's, it's a pity to end on, on not no, such it's, a positive it's nothing, note. nothing about Victor. It's, it yeah, was not yeah. at all his fault or anything. No, I'm just saying that we is. chess players, Swiss chess players, could have benefited and be inspired more okay. by him. Well, let's, let's hope so in the future anyway. Um, yeah, there's people, a few people online uh, talking about... Korchnoi's temper and he was irascible yeah we've, we've discussed that already but um, I have to say okay I'd like to balance that as well because I mean you've talked about how actually you know within the Swiss team he could be uh, very helpful and you know analyze things but um, I can say also when I was working as a journalist and I, I wanted to interview him uh, I was doing a, a radio program for the BBC and mm -hmm. Uh, I asked him, you know, if he wants to talk a little bit about uh, the, the match in, in the Philippines, and he was very happy to do that. And Petra as well, actually, mm -hmm. and and even took. He he was needed to catch a train somewhere, and and said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I'll fit it in. And actually, mm -hmm. so, you know, he he wasn't actually just um, someone who thought about himself. Actually, he what he yeah. you know. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to end on, on that, uh, you know, a nice note and not just remember his temper. No, but of he course, could yeah. be very kind and actually he was very helpful. Yeah, indeed, yeah. My, my ex personal experience, I mean, he never, he insulted many, many players after the game, but I never had a problem mm. like this. Of course, he wouldn't always be happy after yeah. the games, but he was always correct and everything. And uh, that's, that's how I remember him too. I mean, well, I think we're going to wrap things up there. Yannick, thanks very much for sharing your uh, memories of Viktor Korchnoi. Thank and, you, Danny. Um, we've, we've really only touched upon the, the games he played in, in Beale and, of course, you know, his extraordinary chess career. As a, there's one game that I always re remember, and it's his Rook and Pawn in game against Karpov from the Baguio match, where mm. to level the scores at 5 all, that's my personal favourite. So do go out and, you know... Look through his games because they are just extraordinary. So much to learn. Okay, thanks, Yannick, again. And thank you, uh, everybody.